Amen. So, why not? Why not? Just give yourself to whatever it is God's calling you to, and we don't worry about those things. It's funny, later on in Isaiah 60, 61, Jesus actually quotes this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus said, this is Isaiah, 2,000 years ago, proclaimed this about me. But then later on, Jesus says these really strange words. You'll do greater things. Now, is Jesus saying we will proclaim liberty to the captives? We will proclaim that prisoners can be unbound? We can bring healing to the hurting? Yeah. Yeah. Here's this grand calling that we all have, not people with PhDs in Bibleology. Everybody has the calling from God to bring healing to their neighbors, to bring freedom to the people they know who are hurt and bound. That's our calling. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We do just as great a thing. You know, our, our vision, honestly, our vision gets clouded because other things get in the way. Sin, of course, causes us to lose focus. Sin puts a barrier between us and God. We can't see Him. We can't see His promises. We can't see His love and His faithfulness and His joy to us. And only Jesus can correct that vision. Only Jesus is the right set of contacts, if you will, that we need to be able to see Him. And our vision of God is also blocked just by our circumstances because we start looking at what's going on around us and worry about pleasing ourselves. Even when life is good, you know, life is good, taking a life with a moment, taking care of myself, and, you know, we become prideful of everything that's going right for us. Or even when it's bad, we take our eyes off God, we begin to pout and wonder why me, and, and start worrying and doubting, is God really looking? Look at all the stuff happening to me. Is God really taking care of me? And whether it's good or bad, we let other things take our eyes off of God. We let money worries bother us. We worry about our family as we make our lives about just having fun, you know. Our nation is, uh, I'm convinced, the biggest problem with us as Christians in America is comfort and security. We are so caught up with wanting to make sure we are comfortable, make sure we are secure and taken care of, that we really can say to hell with everything else because we're taken care of. That is our biggest problem because Everything else is going to hell, and we need to forget about comfort and security and take the risk to go out and do something that can bring another soul to Christ. C.T. Studd had this thing that was, some people want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell, but I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. That's a little bit riskier. It's probably a little warmer there. But it's also a much better one. A much more fulfilling life. When we know we're doing the thing God has called us to do. There's really there's nothing better than that. God has this grand vision of what he wants to do through us. There's um I read a book just recently that um there, there are several books that I've read that I that I call impactful life changing books. This one is called Naturally Supernatural. And it was really all about how Jesus did ministry. And it's really all tied up in one verse, and I forget what it is, John 5, 6. Basically, Jesus says, I do what the Father tells me. Amen. It's that simple. So can we go around and hear what God is doing, see what God is doing, and put our hand to that? That's the person I want to be. I want to be able to walk into work and ask God, God, what are you doing in my boss's life today? What do you want to do in this person's life? And hear God. See God at work. And then it becomes really easy to do God's business because all we're doing is putting our hand to what He's already doing. You know, last night He didn't go to sleep. Last night He prepared people and He changed things and He orchestrated things so that when we get up, He's already got a plan laid out. All we have to do is say, God, what are you doing today? Find it and go with that. What is God doing? And how can I be a part of it? And that was Jesus. He said it. That's my secret to ministry. All I do is say, God, say, Father, what are you doing? 
and the Father does, I do. We can do that. That's what He's called us to do. In the midst of whatever is happening in our life, the first thing, the most important thing we need to do is turn our vision, turn our focus back to Jesus. And look, you can be moderately successful, or really successful, and you can probably be content without bringing God into the picture. Hey, it's not popular to say, I guess, in Christian circles, but look, we know people who are, seem relatively content and seem happy with their life and don't know God, and they're paying their bills a lot easier than I am. And they've got boats and two or three cars, and I don't. Life seems to be going good for them, and God's not in the picture. The truth of the matter is, yeah, you can, you can go through the life without Him. You, but whether you're a cashier or pastor or a billionaire or ditch digger, nothing you do can compare to doing what God wants you to do. You might be able to be content doing anything else, but you can't be. And Donald Trump and Hugh Hefner and, all, and, and Bill Gates cannot be satisfied in what they do as much as they would be if they found out what God wants. There is contentment here on this earth, and then there is the joy and passion that can only be found in doing what God has called us to do. And that begins, like it did for Isaiah, with getting a clear vision of who God is, what God is doing, what He wants to do in our lives. A friend of mine uh, just posted on Facebook, and this is great, great illustration to him this week. She is going to um, an exercise class. And had for several days ignored. You know how when your gas tank is almost empty, the little, I don't know if you guys have it, I get the little orange gas, uh, um, where it's a light is blinking, where your car yells at you, hey, stupid, get gas. <laughs> but, so she's ignored it for like a week. Here's this little thing on her dashboard saying, get gas, get gas, get gas. Guess what happened on the way to the exercise class? Yeah. Ran out of gas. So she got her exercise by jogging to the exercise <laughs> class. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> Turn around, jog home, got to exercise, and now you're home. But anyway, she, she ignored the warning light, ignored the emptiness. And she wound up jogging instead of driving to her exercise class. And maybe you feel like that. Empty, dry, God seems distant, my vision of who he is and what he wants is a little fuzzy, I'm not sure, I don't know. Don't ignore it. You can't go on ignoring that light that God is trying to say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Don't ignore that. If you feel like you're running on empty, here's some things I want you to try. Just three things I'll mention. First thing is this. After the service, we're going to offer to pray for you. And this, if it's you, you want someone to pray for you, my wife and I will wait up here and, and then we'll pray for you. If that's what you want. And that's just a step. It's a beginning. Pray with someone. Second thing is this. Try a different way to connect to God. And, and here's what I mean. I am one of these, I would, uh, they're, you, know, you can categorize this any way you want to. I'm what I would call an intellectual. I connect to God by reading and studying. That jazzes me. I can sit down with books in the Bible all day long and read and study. And that's good. But if that's gotten old and stale and dry, try something different. If you're an intellectual and you're into study, maybe you try being exuberant in worship. Or maybe you are, like my wife, you love worship, and that's the big thing in your life. Nothing energizes you and gets you closer to God better than worshiping, but you're still not feeling it. Then you try something different. Maybe try serving in a different way in the church. Or if if nature is your thing, you know, you're closest to God when there's dirt under your nails. Do you ever, you know, people like that? I'm like, I love my garden. When I've got dirt under my nails and my knees are so grass stained, I'm close to God. Nature does that for me. And if that's you, maybe you try something like joining in become active in a calling that's bigger than you, like joining the, um, we talked, Chuck talked about it last week, the sex trade movement. My wife is involved heavily in a group called Love 146 that gets involved in ending slavery in our day and age. And you could do something like that, become active in something bigger than you. So just try a new way to connect with God. Third thing I'd say try is this, just pick up a new discipline. If you've never fasted before, give that a try. If you've never spent a long period of time in silence and solitude, just in prayer, then try that. Something new, something different, something to shake up your routine. If you never journal, and I'm horrible at this, by the way, I can't, I always make up my mind, I'm going to journal, I'm going to keep a journal next to my Bible, and the first day I might write like half a page, and I'll skip a couple of days, and I'll write a sentence. And <laughs> but try something, you know, a new discipline, a new way to connect with God. 
There is nothing else we need but a vision of who God is to change us. No matter how close you feel now, whether you feel like God's left you or you've left Him, or, or you feel this close to God, like you and Him, bosom buddies, God can refine and change and bring you even closer when we get a vision, when we focus back on Him. So I encourage you to try that. Find some way to refocus on God. 